It's a piece called Song of Love. Song of Love. It's getting warm in here. I want you all to, um, to help me out with this one. Simple thing. It's, um, it's another love song. It's called a Negro love song. And it's actually a poem. It's a poem um, by one of my favorite poets whose name is Paul Lawrence Dunbar. And um, what I need you all to do is um, to give me a little uh, response. Right? The response is going to be jump back, honey, jump back. Right? Like that. Right? So, I'll show you when to come in. Right? Right there, right? Right there, yeah. <laughs> from my eyes and a smile go flitting by. Jump, jump back, back lady, jump, jump back. back. Heard the wind blow through the pines. Jump, jump back, lady, jump, jump back. back. You know, Mockingbird was singing fine. Jump, jump back, lady, jump, jump back. back. And my heart was beating so when I reached my lady's door that I couldn't bear to go. Jump, jump back, lady, jump, jump back. back. Well, I put my arms around her waist. Jump, jump back, lady, jump, jump back. back. I raised her lips and I took me a taste. Jump, jump back, back, lady, jump, jump back. back. Oh, love me, honey, love me true, love me well as I love you. And she answered, yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> favorite poets because he does, uh, he really epitomizes what it means to be an African in America and he did it in poetry by writing in the dialect of uh, enslaved Africans as they were making that transition to become Americans, if that ever really happened, but mm. he was still making the transition, but nevertheless he, he wrote his poetry. Uh, in in the way that people were speaking at the time, and I thought it uh, I thought it very musical what he did. So I tried to include him in uh, in different things that I've done over the years like that because I think it's um, it's really really great great poetry. Here's another one.
Some of you may know that um, that I worked with Sun Ra for um, a number of years, and um, this is uh, his centennial. He was uh, came on the planet 100 years ago, 1914. This is 2014, so he was he'd been around here 100 years. He's been around here that long. So I'm going to do um, something from the Sun Ra book. Is a very, very special song. You may know it. It goes like this. Sort when you get vibrations from an asteroid, <laughs> tapestry from an asteroid you've caught makes your life filled with space joy. They say that you'll find a gain in sight when all appears to be starlight. You'll find when you are an asterisk, a baby star. <laughs> yeah. So I was good with that word, asteroid, uh, asterisk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that you climb to greater heights. The space ways are not so far, so far. When vibrations hit your heart, that's too high for me. <laughs> Your world becomes a star, a star, no matter who you are. They say that you are a pleasant sort when you get vibrations from an asteroid, and tapestry from an asteroid you've caught. Makes your life filled with space joy. Do rocket number nine. Let's stop doing it. Do rocket number nine. So, so 
I'm going to do rocket number nine for you to see if I have the same reaction. <laughs> <laughs> Goes like this. Rocket number nine take off from the planet to the planet Venus. Rocket number nine take off from the planet to the planet Venus. You do it four times. Rocket number nine take off from the planet to the planet Venus. Rocket number nine take off from the planet to the planet Venus. Zoom, 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 zoom. Up in the air. Up. Zoom, up, zoom, up in the air. Rocket number nine take off from the planet to the planet Venus. Rocket number nine take off from the planet to the planet Venus. Rocket number nine take off from the planet to the planet Venus. Rocket number nine take off from the planet to the planet Venus. Zoom, 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 up in the air. Up, zoom, up, zoom, up in the air. Rocket number nine take off from the planet to the planet Venus. Rocket number nine take off from the planet to the planet. Venus, rocket the banana take off from the planet to the planet. Venus, rocket the banana take off from the planet to the planet. Venus, zoom, 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 up in the air, up, zoom, up, zoom, up in the air. Rocket the banana take off from the planet to the planet. Venus, rocket the banana take off from the planet to the planet. Venus, rocket the banana take off from the planet to the planet. Venus, rocket the banana take off from the planet to the planet. Venus, zoom, 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 up in the air, up, zoom, up, zoom, up in the air. You got it? So that was the rehearsal. <laughs> Here's a, this is the introduction. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta clap. Man. So it's sha bum 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 Can't you read? Can't you see? Can't you read? Can't you see? Can't you read? Can't you see? This is private property. This is private property. On the sign, plain and clear. On the sign, plain and clear. No one is allowed in here. No one is allowed in here. But since you're here, you should know. Since you're here, you should know. We will never let you go. We will never let you go. You can cry, you can shout. You can cry, you can shout. You can't get out. But you can't get out. This is the forest of no return. 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 Those who stumble in, those who stumble in, those who be fumbling, those who be fumbling, never can get out. Never can get out. That's it. Can't you read? Can't you see? Can't you read? Can't you see? This is private property. This is private property. On the sign, plain and clear. On the sign, plain and clear. No one is allowed in here. No one is allowed in here. But since you're here, you should know. Since you're here, you should know. We will never let you go. We will never let you go. You can cry, you can shout. You can cry, you can shout. You can't get out. But you can't get out. This is the farce of no return. This is the farce of no return. <laughs> this is the farce of no return. This is the farce of no return. <laughs> those who stumble in. Those who stumble in. Those who be fumbling. Those who be fumbling. We do this together. Never.
So yeah, um, I had a, a long time working with Sun Ra throughout many different countries, maybe maybe many different planets too. Uh, and uh, it's great. We always had a lot of fun with music because uh, he was a person who loved fun, you know. And um, just being with him on the road was. Um, was just always good times, great times, you know. Um, I'm stalling here, I'm trying to figure out what I'm gonna play next. <laughs> so, you know, give me a minute to stall, right? This um, trumpet and the flugelhorn, I see, is it, are you playing, you playing yet? Yeah. Play with you later. Yeah, man, mm -hmm. you know, um, that's just a rough instrument to play by yourself. <laughs> uh, you gotta, so. It requires a lot of time and energy and and um, chops, long tones and scales and stuff like that, you know, to keep yourself in some kind of shape. So sometimes it's fun, <laughs> but oftentimes when I'm doing long tones, I'm looking at the television or something, man, you know. <laughs> so you know, as I go through the long tones, you know, just to, to while away the time, you know. Um, can I play something for you? You got something you want to play? You got a request? That's a good song. Is it one that you're singing? No. That's a good song. I don't know whether I have enough chops to do it. Let me see if I have chops to do it. <laughs> Eternal Spiraling Spirit uh, actually was done on my first recording. It came out as a leader called Life Sports in 1979. I wrote it uh, for my children, my, my sons, twin sons, uh, Rashid and Shahid, because um, they um, had this thing where they would run on, move around the floor, one would be going that way, one would be going the other way. And they, they both looked like, reminded me of my father. So I really saw the you know, the spirit of, of their grandfather in them and, and me in them as well. So I called the song that I wrote while they were doing that eternal spiraling spirit. Now my wife has asked me to play it. Now I have to see whether I can actually play it right now. <laughs> Mm-hmm. 
um, this one is, um, I used to, we used to close out our sets um, at a man once called Solomonic Unit. It would be the Solomonic Quartet. It started out as a quartet, then wound up being a quintet, and a sextet, and a septet. Um, various people were in and out of the band, but it was consistently Charles Moffitt who was on, um, on drums. And uh, some of you may know Charles Moffitt after playing about 1997 or so. But we would always close out with this song. Um, it's called uh, Morequino or Canto II. Yeah. And it's, um, it's done in an ancient, ancient language. Um, it's a combination of Portuguese and some ancient African language. Uh, and it comes from um, a woman named Clementine de Jesus, uh, who is, um, who compiled the whole collection of um, songs of enslaved Africans. And the uh, recording is called Song of Slaves. So this is um, Canto to Monicumio. Samba na kakunda Buruguna odi fayo Buruguna odi fayo Patiku kiki lo kutondumba Buruguna odi fayo Buruguna odi fayo Patiku kiki lo kutondumba Eh, shora shora Kanku ede vera Shora kanku shora Eh, shora shora, kanku e kambara, shora kanku shora. Morikinyu pika nino, morikinyu pika nino, pati kikiki samba na kakuna. Buruguna odifayo, buruguna odifayo, pati kikiki lo kutondumba. Buruguna odifayo, Buruguna odifayo, pati kiki lo kutondumba. Eh, shara shara, kanku e de vera, shara kanku shara. Eh, shara shara, kanku e kambara, shara kanku shara.
That's hard work, you know. Uh, yeah. Solo trumpet, man. I, I don't think I've done a solo trumpet gig in years. <laughs> I know why, too. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, um, and thank you all. There's so much um, music inside your music, and there's so much music inside this room. Um, all right, well, one of the things that came to me is um, how you approach a playing. Mm -hmm which is, uh, it's from the tradition of, uh, I think, of, of speaking. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, uh, it's, playing, it's playing the music like you talk to us. Right. And uh, it's a, uh, I think it identifies, uh, it's, it's a whole, it's a whole, uh, can you, this is a way of approaching music. Can you talk about that a little bit, just for a second? Yeah, well, I do believe that the first instrument is the voice. Yeah, and, um, and that's what I think all instrumentalists are trying to get back to the voice. Um, they, I think that's what we try to do. You know, we try to emulate the voice. We try it in, in any way we can. You know, we, um, I learned when, while working with Sun Ra that um, that we had to sing, in fact, you know, that everybody in the Sun Ra Band sings, right? You know, care how, how your voice sounds, you sing, you know what I'm saying? Because that brings out a certain thing that um, it relates to people, you know, um, even if a person can't play an instrument, they can talk, right, hopefully, and, um, and so that will then allow you to communicate yeah. with people in another kind of way. I think most everyone would say that on some level, but I think that it's more specific. It's more, mm -hmm. I think what I'm trying to get is more, it's the, not just the sounding like the voice. Yes. It's the talking. It's, the, it's an approach that's um, not going for a pure tone necessarily, but mm -hmm. going for the personal, the mm -hmm. personal language. Um, yeah, and I think that that's uh, that's essential to a whole movement in music that's largely African. Uh, I hear you, I hear you, and I and I totally agree. You know, it's um, it's trying to get that what what's inside of you out, trying to get the inside out, <laughs> um, and and it's a process. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a probably a lifelong process. Um, you know, it's certainly something that I've been trying to do um, as, 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 as long as I can remember. All right, so if we're, if you're in your speaking with people, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> what are then what we are speaking about? Mm -hmm. And uh, and I want to start out a little bit Historically, mm -hmm. so when you're when you're a couple, well, first of all, where were you born? I was I was born in Harlem Hospital, um, <laughs> uh, and I grew up the first 16 years of my life in Harlem. Uh, and um, the Harlem that I had grew up in was a very very different kind of Harlem than the Harlem of today. Yeah, um, I lived on 131st Street between Madison and Park in Harlem. And, um, and when I was a, a young teenager, I used to go by 125th Street and, and I heard all of the great uh, nationalist activists, political activists like Malcolm X, Adam Clayton Powell, James Farmer, and uh, many others speak right there on 125th Street. Uh, Where? 125th Street and 7th Avenue. Is, um, they called it Harlem Square until they knocked it down um, and put up the uh, the state office building uh, there. Uh, they didn't want people to congregate like that. So they, they destroyed the, you know, Harlem Square and the whole communion. That Wasn't the community there a had. rock or something there that people used to? I remember. See, I had PBS, you know? <laughs> Never mind. No, they did That's have big. There was something that people used to touch for a good luck or something. Oh, you're talking about the Apollo? The Apollo. Yeah, that's no, Apollo. No. Yeah. no, no. 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 On the street, but anyway, never mind. P forget it. Yeah. Uh, that was an aside. Yeah. No, so, all right, so did you go up to the Ola Tunji studio also? I did. I mean, um, 
Olatunji's center came much later, you know, I mean, it um, came after I left Alamanatal in about 62, um, 63, something oh. like that, and came down to the Low East Side. I was, um, you know, spent um, my teenage, my later teenage years on the Low East Side. So um, that that was a real different um, different change. And, and I was going to um, Brooklyn Tech. I managed to uh, go from Harlem, uh, being in a, a completely segregated environment from the first grade until the eighth grade, to going to Brooklyn Tech, and I was the only black person in my class uh, for four years at Brooklyn Tech. Wow! Um, because there weren't many, there weren't many African Americans going to Brooklyn Tech. Now, what we did in Brooklyn Tech was we banded together. Uh, we had Freedom Riders tables. Right, so all of the all of the black kids would all come together and sit at the same table at lunchtime. That was the only way we could really deal with what was going on throughout the day, you know, in the classes, because it was really, 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 very, very, very racist um, and very oppressive, but psychologically so, you know, with subtle things that uh, would happen that would um, take away your feeling of humanity. Um, but it was real, you know. So um, I started reading. I started reading existential literature in, in high school. Dostoevsky and Camus and Sartre and all those cats, because um, I was trying to understand what what was going on here, you know. And of course, this was during the, the height of the civil rights movement, you know. So '61 to '65, when I was in uh, when I was in high school, it was the height of the civil rights movement. So I didn't really start playing. I got my trumpet in 19. Uh, 61 before uh, I came to Brooklyn Tech and that's a story in and of itself um, because I, I picked up the trumpet because uh, my my sister who turned me on to music um, died in 1961 just as I was going to Brooklyn Tech she was like she was my big sister she was like 10 years older than me she was the one who turned me on to the music uh, I used to listen to uh, this recording called Dinah Jams um, with um, trumpet players Manor Ferguson, Clifford Brown, Clark Terry on it, playing great trumpet, Max Roach was playing drums. And so I listened to this record as I was growing up uh, because that was my sister Marilyn's record, you know, and she had a whole bunch of jazz records that she turned me on to. Then when she died, she died of, at 24, I was... 13, 14, right? Uh, she died of a botched abortion because abortions were illegal during that time, and, and she bled to death, right, in our, you know, the place that we lived. You know, it was, it was horrible. I couldn't, I couldn't put my understanding emotionally. I couldn't, I couldn't, you know, as a teenager, I had no way of being able to understand it. So the only thing that I could do was I, I went, I was, uh, I would sweep floors at the. Uh, at the um, building uh, next door to where we lived. We lived in 49 East under 31st Street. I swept floors and I saved up enough money to buy my first trumpet from a pawn shop on, in Harlem for $35, yeah. And I, my, my parents were poor, you know, so they, you know, they, they, and they were completely out of it. This was their oldest daughter. When she died, they were out of it. Everybody was out of it, you know. And so the only thing I did was uh, I picked up the trumpet and learned how to play the trumpet, right? You know, like that. I got a, a teacher. And the rest, you know, I just, but I didn't play that much at Brooklyn Tech because it was like horrible. You know, um, I didn't want to be in the band. I didn't, I just wanted to leave the school. You know, I really just wanted to get out of there. Uh, and and the, the thing about it was that my sister was the first person I told that I'd been accepted to the school. I don't even know why I went to the school, right? Because uh, I do know why. I was misguided by a guidance counselor. <laughs> guidance counselor said, you should be glad to go to Brooklyn Tech, young black boy, or something like that. You know, <laughs> Brooklyn Tech is like, you know, one of the greatest schools in the city. You should be glad. What the hell am I going to Brooklyn Tech for? I don't want to be an architect, you know? You know, I really, well, that wasn't down with that, but, but Nevertheless, um, I went there and I went through all of that. One of the things that um, that I got to understand in uh, being in Brooklyn Tech was something about education. We, uh, I was on the radio yesterday on Daryl's show, and we were playing um, a track by um, Rat Brown, and he was talking about the difference between being educated and being trained. 
Yeah. You know, and uh, you know what I learned being in Brooklyn Tech for four years is that you actually they were educating, they were educating their students, their majority white students to lead. They were, because we had cross references. I mean, you know, you had pattern making. Uh, and then you made the pattern, you know, you had the electrical shop, you know, you, you saw, you had industrial processes where you understood how things were put together, you know. So there, were, there was a way where you could understand how things were connected. You were really educated there, yeah. You weren't trained, you were educated, yeah, you know. So that's one of the things, that, that was the big takeaway for me from Brooklyn Jack. I, I learned how to be educated. I learned how to make connections. So I made those connections. Uh, my life in Harlem, growing up in Harlem, the civil rights movement, made those connections. By the time I went to Queens College, that's when I put it all together, right? I was so glad to get out of Brooklyn Tech. I never even went to the graduation. You know, I just left. But the, 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 school, um, the school had such a reputation that I was able to go to college just based on the reputation that uh, Brooklyn Tech had, you know, without a diploma, right? I don't know how I did that, but I did it. You know? And, and that's when I met cats like I met Arthur Williams in Queens College. I met um, Charles Downs, who's now Charles Downs, and then later became Rashid Bakar, right? I met him at Queens College, right? And um, uh, Farouk Lamont Finnan, right? He was the trumpet player. There were four of us all playing trumpet, right? And we were, we were armchair revolutionaries. We would sit back and talk about how we were going to deal with the system, you know, <laughs> what we were going to do, you know, and everything. But it was just talk. You know, we didn't do anything, right? <laughs> you know, I mean, we played, we played music, you know, we played music and we went by this cat, uh, Eric Brown's house and, uh, you know, great musicians would come by, Don Isla came by and played, you know, lots of musicians, Milford Graves would come by like that, you know. Eric Brown studied with Milford Graves, so. So that's, um, that's basically, you know, the background that I had as far as the music is concerned. How did you get, in, did you, what was your role at the, can you tell people a little bit about the East? Because not everyone's going to know stuff. I mean, you're naming a lot of names that maybe I know, but the one you, maybe just tell them, explain them what the East was, okay. and sort of the story about that a little briefly. Yeah, the East fast forwards for me um, to about 1968. Um, I lived on the Low East Side when I left my parents. Uh, uh, I was about 18 years old. I lived on 10th Street between uh, Avenue B and C, 377 East 10th Street. And then uh, I moved up to the Bronx, and I moved up to the Bronx, and then I got a job working in Brooklyn at a third, uh, the daycare center, 13 10 Atlantic Avenue. Yeah. The, the relationship between 13 10 Atlantic Avenue and the East was that there were people who worked in both of these uh, community uh, places, right? And so, um, so I got to uh, meet many of the people. The East was an alternative school. It was called Yurisasa Shule, Yurisasa School, right? You know, um, and they were uh, the um, the founder, G2 Wayusi, was a teacher in the public school system. Les Campbell was his uh, former name. And so he opened this school, which was a school where they were trying to give people, they called it back then a head start, uh, trying to... Uh, inculcate people with an idea of their own culture as opposed to what they would be learning in the public school system. And so um, culture was a very big part of, of what they did. Uh, they would have performances there on Saturdays and, um, and they would have performances. Uh, people would come and play during the week. It was a tin claver place um, between uh, Putnam and uh, Fulton. It's no longer there. There's nothing there. And this is something that um, we were talking about yesterday. There are all these historical places, man, that, um, where the music happened at. But there's no, you can walk there and you see nothing to identify the music happened there, you know. I mean, and great music would happen there. There's no landmark preservation as far as the music is concerned. It's like we're an afterthought, you know. We were there, it happened, it's gone. Why do you think that is? <laughs> well, it's, it's because there's no organization uh, that is really trying to do that. There's nobody organized enough to try to do that, to actually put landmarks on places where people perform that. Yeah? And nobody really thinks this is important enough to do it. And so you gotta, there's got to be an organization that, that really is about doing that. Landmark preservation, you know, naming these buildings. Maybe I'm, you know, maybe I'm paranoid and mm -hmm. crazy. Man. That could very well mm -hmm. be. But 
I sometimes wonder whether it's sort of not a conscious conspiracy, but a sort of a general agreement to let things go. A general, not, you know, not like, because it will cause too much, too edgy. Yeah. It was too confrontational. It was too, so um, anyway. Well, um, to your point, um, this is one of the things that we talked about yesterday on the radio as well. We had the, um, we began it uh, with Stokely Carmichael uh, making uh, a speech about um, black power. And it was a speech that he delivered in 1967, you know, after he came up with the whole idea of black power. I read, uh, Peniel Joseph wrote a book on, uh, on Stokely Carmichael. It's a brilliant, brilliant book. The thing is that I love Stokely Carmichael, but I didn't know anything about him until I read that book. It's not like Martin Luther King and Malcolm X, you know, like you can find, you know, biographies up the wazoo on Malcolm X and Martin Luther King. You know, there's lots of information on that. Stokely Carmichael is a different order of being. You know, we don't, we don't really have information on him until Peniel Joseph wrote this book. Why that is, I believe, is because he had so clearly articulated and analyzed this system and uh, was something that was fright frightening, the, that scared the bejesus out of the powers that be in this country. And they did everything to suppress him. They did everything to suppress the generation of musicians coming after him. The whole 1970s was completely suppressed. You know, I mean, you know, if there weren't uh, private, uh, small record labels, you would have very little music um, coming out of the 1970s because he was able to tie that together, the political, cultural, social realities put it together. And for that, he was, he had to leave this country. He married Mary McKeever, they banned her in this country, right? You know, they did everything to suppress everything that he did. And this is the state of affairs still. I mean, we're still grappling with the fact that people can't understand what, you know, the music of the 70s was all about. You know? It's really the 50s, 60s, and 70s. It's that whole era. And in fact, just a little aside, uh, relating to what you said, it's mm -hmm. like, it's the only period of time that like, if people say, oh, they, that they refer to it as throwback to. You can be a, they never say throwback to the 40s mm. or throwback to the 30s or the 20s. They only say throwback to the 60s. Or, and the 60s really is code for late 50s, 60s, and 70s. Mm. It's the only period of time where it's, it's so threatening somehow that it's constantly, um, and I think it's, as I said, I think it's somehow an unconscious conspiracy because it was somehow so threatening to, to you know, status quo. Yeah, it, it, and it's one of the reasons why we have a, a permanent avant-garde. I mean, avant-garde is the music of the 1970s. Nobody, there's no avant-garde in the 1980s, 1990s. You know, the people who came up in the 70s, we are the permanent avant-garde. You know, that's it. <laughs> well, yeah. Anyway, yes, I, I like to refer to you. There are probably many who don't, but I agree with you. Um, I'm just, I did write out some notes. Um, and let me see. Uh, all right, I, one of the questions I said is, can you talk about the role that free jazz played in building self-empowerment in African-American communities and using the East and also Sisters place as a... Um, why and also why did the East stop and what happened? I don't know why the East stopped. I don't um, that that's beyond my purview. I don't um, you know I wasn't involved with the East like that. I was involved as a performer and involved in, in the other organization, Thirteen Ten Atlanta Avenue. But I don't I can't tell you why it stopped. Um, I do know that um, what they did was um, what has not stopped is the International African Arts Festival, which was a component of the East. The, the International African Arts Festival still goes on every year around the July uh, 4th weekend 
um, and for three or four days, um, you know, they um, have some of the greatest artists in the world playing at Commodore Barry Park in Fort Greene. And so that has not stopped. And, and some of the grandchildren of the people who started it are still working with that 40 years, you know, outside of uh, the um, origin of the, East, uh, it's the International African Arts Festival is still an outgrowth of that and it's still functioning. Right? Now, as far as Sister Space is concerned, I started working in Sister Space in 1998. Uh, Sister Space started in 1995. And um, it started. It was started by um, activists, political activists that um, call themselves, um, I don't know what they call themselves, the December 12th movement. movement, Harry Tubman Collective, they have uh, various Patrice names, Mumba. Patrice the Mumba <laughs> Coalition, you know, New York Eat, right? And so, um, but they had a real interest in the music. And so, um, I came there to work on my memoir uh, with Luis Reyes Rivera, who, uh, who worked on uh, helping me to write it, and um, and he's then a I'm great poet who's now deceased. Great poet, fantastic poet, and so we worked together uh, doing that at the at Sister's place, and and I knew who they were. They didn't know who I was, and eventually they heard me play and they asked me to be the music director, and that started in 1998. So I've been the music director from 1998 right on to 2014. Being there, we've developed this um, idea of what this music is about. You know, in the in the 20th century, um, many people had uh, problems with the word jazz. Right? They would say, um, Duke Ellington, you know, had problems with it. Uh, you know, Charlie Mingus, everybody had problems with it. Right? So, we said that we would come up with a thesis as to what this music is about for the 21st century. So we called it jazz. We kept the word jazz. We said jazz and music of the spirit. And why we kept the word jazz was because of teachings I had from Sun Ra. Jazz is a spiritual, uh, it, if you understand something about numerology, uh, J is equal to 10 in numerology. A is equal to 1. And um, the two Zs are 26. And you add that, uh, add that across. J10, A1, um, right, that's 11, and then you get 11 and 52. What is that, right? 11 and 52, 26 plus 26, right? What do you get? That <laughs> 63, right? 63. And it's a 9. 63 is a, 63 is a 9, because that's what you have to reduce numbers to 1 to 9, right, in numerology, right? And so 9 is the most powerful number on the planet, right? Because you take nine and you multiply it by the number, it's going to come up nine, right? It's a spiritual number, right? You know? And Sun Ra understood that. So he never had a problem with the word jazz, right? He said, jazz, you know, it's a spiritual, you know, art form, right? So I took that and said, jazz, a music of the spirit, right? In fact, I say that all of our art forms, all of the art forms that African people enslaved Africans in this country created are art forms of the spirit. And why, why do I come up with that? Because I believe that there's an omnipresent, omnipotent, omniscient creator. I don't care what you want to call it, you call it whatever you want to, Buddha, uh, Allah, Jesus, you know, you know, whatever you want to call it. But, but still, that omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent reality is in everything, everybody, right? You know, we're all the one, you know, two is one, you know, like that. So, so you can't, if you have that oneness, you can't have people imbalanced by not being respected because of their humanity, right? There has to be a balance restored, right? So a balance had to be restored to African people in this country, yeah? Respectability to their humanity had to occur, yeah? It still is work being worked on, but I believe that these art forms that were given to this country are art forms that help to restore that balance. You understand what I'm saying? You know, to allow people to be respected for their humanity. All people have to be respected for their humanity because all people are all the one. Yeah, and so it's, it's absolutely essential for that to occur. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> I want to uh, open this up. I mean, I think that is really interesting. Everything you're talking about is really interesting, but it's really more something more. It's really important. Yeah, if, if, um, if we're all in part of the conversation, because then 
it you know it becomes meaningful to us. So I will, I really hope that other people have. Please ask us questions. Please state your point of view about what he's been talking about about the the root you know rooting this music in 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 personal history in cultural history and how it's impacting and you know talk you can talk about it from the past or maybe you know or you can talk about it in the present but talk talk to him talk to us <laughs> talk let me hear what you think have a, let's let's converse i'll give you a minute <laughs> and percolate some thoughts here. Yeah, yeah, please. Uh, what do you think of the uh, environment for music now, creativity? What do you think the environment is for music, creativity? Oh, yeah, no, arts in general. Because oh. so I, I migrated here nine years ago mm -hmm. from Hong Kong, mm -hmm. and I thought I was cheated out because I, I thought I was coming to the 60s, mm. America. Like, and I, and I, got, I got surprised and I got spooked because it's so conservative here. I was like, mm. oh my God, what's going on here? Mm. That's a good question. <laughs> um, what happened? You, you said, so you asked me what happened? <laughs> yeah, what happened? <laughs> <laughs> There's something missing here. You know? yeah. I don't get it. <laughs> yeah. I get, you know, I believe that there have always been pockets of resistance. Um, you know, I don't know that. Um, I think that probably we have less pockets of resistance now than we had before, but there have always been places like this, right, that um, where people were able to come together communally and keep moving ahead, you know, to encourage, which is why we still have the music, why we have these art forms, because there have always been those places. And, you know, it, it, I don't think that, because I believe that the arts in America go against the very grain of what capitalism is about. Yeah, that you uh, are never going to find full fledged support for the arts until the system is changed. You know, a system that deals upon win lose, where I'm winning because you're losing, is not one that is supportive of the arts. The arts are about win win, you know, and that flies in the face of what the system is about. So I'm saying that they, I don't think that. I think that we, things have changed, you know, but even within that change, I think that there's still these pockets of resistance. And I think it's going to be that way because that's the way we are as human beings. We have to be free. Yeah. Yeah, but New York is becoming less and less affordable. Wow. Oh, this is true. Well, we're, we're just waiting for the bubble to burst. Yes. And we're just waiting for like the day when like, they're, oh my God, I can't rent out all these high rises. And, and like, then we can, yeah. I'm, I'm praying. But in the, yeah. in the meantime, uh, uh, yeah. And, and one of, it, well, one of my theories on this whole thing is like there was when in, back in the day, those the, those magical decades, uh, you could there was freedom in the air, and what you smell in the air now is fear, yeah. and it's act, but it's also changing again. I actually am feeling a change, a shift. I mean, still things are out, you know, the the bubble hasn't burst, but I I feel like there's a uh, People are beginning to wake up. I just feel it. But it starts small. It starts small. Anyway, so I'm not supposed to talk so much. <laughs> My daughter is right there, so you know, she'll let me know if I overdid. <laughs> so please. No pressure. <laughs> yeah, she we pressure each other. It's called family. <laughs> Someone raised their hand back there. Oh, yeah, please. Now, other than Sun Ra, who highly influenced you in Art and Art Jazz, and who do you think are some of the founders of that style, other than Sun Ra? Because I know he took it out there, but who else, in your opinion, took it out there to that level? Well, I love one that Coleman. Um, you know, so, and, and, and Don Cherry, I think that um, those are the two names that come to mind immediately, one and Don, for sure. Um, you know, probably a lot of, you know, I, I spend a lot of time listening to to artists, man. So I'm, you know, um, 
any number of people, you know, um, who I've heard have influenced me, you know, like that, you know, I don't, you know, I don't try to stop them from influencing me, you know. I allow influences to happen like that, you know. Can you talk a little bit about your understanding of going out there, um, um, maybe your attention to certain things like melody, can you talk a little bit about how you, your concept in terms of music? My concept is to, is to learn as many See, I, I, I do love melodies. If you may if, if discern, um, you know, I'm, I'm not an avant-gardist that is amelodic. You know, I do love melodies. I think that, I think that um, songs are, are really uh, key to, um, to a certain form of communication. So, you know, uh, that, that's one of the reasons, thank you very much, that's one of the reasons I, I, I love Ornette because he wrote these beautiful songs, man. You know, beautiful melodies. You know, and 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 from that, you know, you can take off. You can go anywhere. You know, but you you always need some something. I believe, uh, you know, this is the con concept this, that comes from uh, Roland Alexander. Roland Alexander would always say concept. He said you gotta have a concept. <laughs> so you know, <laughs> you know. So my concept is that uh, you gotta have a, a basis. You know, to you know, to fly with, you know, like that. So yeah. yeah. Okay, go on. Go. <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead. You go. Go ahead. You go. Yeah. I had a question for other people. I, I mean, one of the things that I'm interested about is, you know, like I don't know your name. Who came from Hong Kong? Is this Rose? So Rose was this? I'm not from our originally from Hong Kong, I'm originally from southwestern China, next to Tibet. Okay. Yeah. So Rose was oh expressing um, a disappointment of coming to the states of New York and wanting to, to find something that was a little bit more fertile and nutritious, maybe? Uh, I don't the want to concept of America. Well, that's Which something I, I can't chew right really now. Really but <laughs> I will <laughs> talk I about. You know? Um, <laughs> but I guess my question was was um, just you know a feeling of, of looking for something you haven't found yet, and then I asked, well, what what is it that we are looking for? What is a vitamin that we need to keep moving, and how can we keep producing that cell? for ourselves as a community right here, right now. Like, what is it? Because like, 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 when I hear music, there, the sincerity of what happens in this kind of setting especially, I feel very good afterwards. I feel like I ate a very healthy meal and it sustains me for a certain amount of time and it shifts my perspective. You know, I mean, the point many times is we're all relying on something, we're all, taking refuge in something. We're all getting protection for something, you know, whether it is, I had a long day, I'm watching TV. I had a long day, I'm gonna do this. Whatever it is, we're always, we need something. So what is it that, I, I just, I don't know. <laughs> but like. Spiritual food. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where do you get so, your spirit, what is your spiritual food? Yeah. Where do you get Where it? Where do we get oh. our spiritual yeah. food? Can I mm -hmm. respond? Respond? Yes, yeah. Bill, yeah. I'll respond. <laughs> I've been to a number of these salons, they're amazing, and you've done a lot of work to do this. And I think one of the things that I find lacking in arts communities as a painter mm. is people are not willing to give in order to get. Mm. And that's part of the capitalism that's taken the art, mm -hmm. right? Like you're taught that you're supposed to go and you're supposed to do for yourself, and someone's going to come and you're whisked up into the, you know, the stratosphere and it's going to be great and you're going to make all this money. But mostly I talk to young artists and they're just, either they're in a group of their friends and they're doing stuff for each other, but when I talk to people who are looking for community, it's like they want community to come to them, but they're not always willing to do the work. And a lot of times you just got to open yourself and be like, okay, what, what's needed to get done? Hmm. And then you're going to get back because you're saying this is amazing and it is amazing, but you put in a hell of a lot of work. <laughs> and that's like you're going to get something amazing back, but you can't get back if you're not willing to give. You know. And 
on the boobs, though. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I've left a lot of boobs. <laughs> I, I guess I found the right boobs. Would you like to, do you think it's time to wrap it up? I want to make sure that everybody knows what AFA is. Oh, what is AFA? <laughs> arts for Arts. I, yeah, I forget. Uh, and, I, and I made a thing about, said no, something about it amongst ourselves. There's a couple of things what that What about I, my question? What? You <laughs> had a question? Oh, I'm no, sorry. Go ahead. Arts no, for Arts. No, no Arts for Arts. No, I'm going to talk to him when I actually interview him. I just want to perform <laughs> All right. I, Arts for Arts. Arts for Art started uh, as a as an artist organized artist run uh, festival. It um, it was to serve the need the fact that there were not people were not coming together and you just never saw each other. Musicians didn't see each other except in Europe. Because there was no gathering place of this kind of improvised music. In fact, improvised music was sort of disappearing, and it becomes so, like, you you know, what do you want to do? Starve to death? What are you? Are you crazy? Why are you playing that stuff? It just wasn't. It wasn't supported. It wasn't. People had given up on it, and so, and there was no place to gather. Um, and also because. It just looked like everything was becoming all, <coughs> all that was, well. Okay, so what, do, how, what does AMA have to do with underline? All right. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't want to hear all the other it's stuff. All right, if you want to hear the other stuff, come to me afterwards. I'm supposed <laughs> to get to the point now. Arts for Art uh, presents the Vision Festival. It presents, it and but the underlying it. series is to make sure that this music isn't just being preached to the same people. Mm -hmm. That we may, that this music and the dance and the visual arts and the spoken word that, and the and the thinking that's associated with this kind of music that's really about pushing edges and it can have different manifestations. D different because every artist is themselves, so no one musician sounds the same. But it's this this intensity of purpose, and uh, that it have that it become available to more people, especially younger people. That you weren't taught about it in any music schools. In fact, in some schools, you you were punished if you listened to it, or God forbid, try to play it. I mean, that's a fact. I'm not making that up. Anyway, so we want to make sure it's available. And so a bunch of young, uh, younger people than myself gathered together with me, the oldster, and started putting these salons together to present and make this music available to you. And I'm all into community. It's about building community. It's about uh, creating a fertile ground, as Miriam likes to put. Yeah? And so, um, anyway, that's what it, that's far it is, the underline, and we have the evolving series. It's a, a Monday night series that is running through the end of July and will start up in the fall again. There's uh, some postcards about it. I also Frequent have some, the salons. Yeah, what? How frequent are the salons? Once a month, but we're taking off August. We'll probably start again in September after we have a meeting next week to decide that. And um, the salons are kind of by invitation. If anyone wants to host them, they should let Miriam or Paul or Julia or someone, who, you know, whoever was your contact here, let them know. And we'll find out you want to host one. Great. It's about sharing this this kind of creativity and this kind of thinking also. Um, and by the way, I brought some old some brochures from the festival that just passed, not because you could so that you'll feel bad that you missed it, which that's <laughs> optional. But there's some articles in there uh, about that talk about I'm this, pass this, this music. around now and um, we can take a Thing and yeah, thing and, 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 and put really, dollars in. Really, it's really important that you that you donate. I, it's, it's just not cool if you don't actually. Despite what Marion said, it's actually not cool. 
Um, thank and you, I know you guys to tonight. Julian, very much for hosting this night. This is Yay. Thank you, Patricia, for, for helping us do all this. And thank you, Austin.